Court helped me out in that confirmation in his uh, devotional reading. So I want you to turn with me to Ephesians. He read from Ephesians chapter 4. And so we're going to read beginning at Ephesians chapter 2. And so I'm going to talk just for a few minutes from the subject, The Way We Work. The Way We Work. There was a songwriter, and if you're over 50, you would not have a clue, but her name was Jean Knight, and uh, she wrote this song, Mr. Big Stuff. You know, just who do you think you are? You know, one of those 67 and all that. You know, because back then, when, when a lot of us couldn't afford much stuff, there will always be somebody that can afford two suits and, and, and didn't have to have a used car, but had a, a new car. Amen. You know, we got, we got in the back, some we talk, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, and so it was always somebody that had a little bit of something, and they thought they were all of that, right? It was always in the midst of us struggling, there was always that one woman that can afford three wigs and four handbags, and she thought she was all of that, right? And so there was a lot of songs back then talking about Mr. Big Stuff and who do you think you are? And even in the other side of the, uh, the charts, uh, I think about the song Bad, Bad, Leroy Brown and, and Mr. Jim and, and all these people who had the big head. And so that was the problem in the church at Ephesus. Paul established that church, and so they had some new Jewish converts that changed over to Christianity, and they had Gentile converts that uh, accepted the Lord. And so they thought they were all of that. The Gentile Christians, you know, converts, they thought that their salvation was better than the Jewish converts. And the Jews said, well, we're the one, we're the chosen ones. And so they thought that their, con their conversion, their salvation was better than the Gentiles. And so Paul writes this letter to tell them, hey, ne neither one of y'all can get big. Because it was by grace that you were saved, right? And so that's what Paul does. He lays out this letter, just about all of Paul's letters. He, he lays it out doctrine and duty. Because he says, you know, I just really believe that people would do better if they knew better, right? And so Paul lays out all of most of his letters with a whole bunch of doctrine of the believer. And then he goes to the duty of the believer. And so even in, uh, you know how Romans chapter 12, we like to quote it. Paul says, therefore, by the mercies of God. And so if you want to say, well, what are the mercies of God? It's chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. All of that leads up to the duty of the believer. And so even in Ephesians, Deacon Court read it. He began at verse 4. But verse 1 of chapter 4, Paul says, therefore, meaning after he done laid out all that doctrine stuff, which we don't deal with it, all that doctrinal stuff, he said, I just believe you do that if you know better. And so after he did all that, he gets to chapter 4, and he says, therefore, I beseech you that you walk worthy of the temptation of which you're called, right? And so, and so we're just going to deal with chapter 2, just a little snippet of chapter 2 this morning. Amen? Amen. So Paul reminds them that their, their conversion was not better than somebody else. And I see that even still today. You know, uh, you know, Jesus says, he told us to take to the disciples, to take the message, but he says, beginning in Jerusalem and to Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so here we see that in America, you know, the last great nation, the last continent to receive Jesus Christ. And sometimes people in the United States act like we got a monopoly on Christianity. We act like our salvation is better than anybody else's. Act like, you know, you know, we look on TV and you see people in South Africa dancing and doing all that. People say, those ain't Christians. I'm like, who are we to say that? We the last folks on earth. And, all right. Last people on earth to get that, right? You know, who are we to say that our salvation is better than others? There's even a denomination that, that teaches, I won't say their name, it starts with the M and they live out in Utah, but there, there, there's a denomination that even think that the United States is the new paradise, is the new garden of Eden. And this is, yeah, garden of Eden train has been transplanted right there to New York. I, maybe you didn't see the movie New Jack City. <laughs> 
And so, and so, and so, and so. So Paul says, no, we don't have a right to brag on our salvation because we didn't really earn it anyway. And so Paul reminded the church in chapter 1, he says, no, 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 talking to the Ephesians, the uh, Jewish uh, Christians, as well as the Gentile Christians, Paul says, no, we have been seated together in heavenly places. He says, so no, no, we're still in the same body, you know, came out of the same womb, that which produced you, produced me. What produces our faith in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so Paul says that, you know, you may be homeless, may be an unimportant line, but you are seated together in Christ because your permanent, your record of address is heaven. So Paul does not use, I'm going to sneak up to chapter 2, I'm still in chapter 1, you can read it for homework. Paul does not use the word Trinity at all, but throughout the book he talks about the Trinity. He does not use it. He says the Father loved us, the Son saved us, and the Holy Spirit sealed us. Then he says redemption all along was planned by the Father, purchased by the Son, and preserved by the Holy Spirit. And so a lot of people say, well, I don't see where the Trinity, I don't see the word Trinity in the Bible. No, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but the use and the description is throughout the Bible. Amen? Amen. And so sometimes, Paul says, and sometimes in order to appreciate what you have and where you need to be, we get the Ephesians chapter 4, one, one day soon, Paul says, in order to appreciate what you have, the way you need to be in chapter 4 is good to remember how things were before you were saved. And Paul does this in chapter 2. He says, And you have he quickened, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Before we accepted Christ, we were physically living, but spiritually dead and, and separated from God. I went to a funeral the other day, and, and, and you know how people walk around the cast and they whisper little things, you know, like, I'm going to miss you, baby, and I'm going to miss you, mama, or, or I'm going to miss you, daughter, and all of these, and they whisper little things and may tap the body, and that's okay, and that's all that, but, but, but the body really never responds, amen? Amen, and somebody said, praise the Lord. I, I understand, I understand. I understand. And so the point is, the body is, is, is just dead. You know, the body cannot respond. And, and I remember I was helping my daughters uh, get through it when, when, when my father died and they couldn't understand. And, and I took this glove and, and took this glove and, and, and I uh, put their hand in the glove and I took the hammer. I said, can I hit your hand? And they said, you know, looked at me like I was crazy. And then I took the hand out of the glove and, and I hit the hammer, you know, real hard on the glove. And I said, did you feel that? They says, no. I said, why not? She said, my hand is not in the glove. I said, well, that's what happened to granddad. The, you know, the inside, that which made him move, live, and have his men, is gone on to be with God. And they just put the glove in the ground. And so it's okay if they put dirt on it. He doesn't feel that because he's not inside of that anyway. Yeah, and, so, and so the physical body doesn't really respond to those things. I'm trying to sneak up to our text, amen? And so, and so just as a person physically dead does not respond to physical things, in like manner, Paul reminded us that a person spiritually dead was unable to respond to spiritual things. And Paul says, stop getting big head, you need to realize that you were born that way. We were born that way. I was in Cleveland last week, and needless to say, the news is pretty much the same as Cincinnati. Looked like the same people, same old, same old story. Somebody was shot here, somebody gunned out here, somebody was there, somebody was there. And one of the news uh, things is the victim had, was, had a little pulse, but by the time they got to the hospital, they were dead on arrival. DOA. And what Paul reminds us in this text is that we were all born that way. We came into this world dead on arrival. We were born spiritually dead. You might have been kicking and doing all that stuff, but spiritually we were separated from God. And so Paul says all of mankind is that way because of Adam's sins, we all come into the world dead on arrival, spiritually disconnected from God and actually having no awareness that we were even dead. There's a whole lot of folks walking around spiritually dead. And I think about uh, this was like 2001, this movie with uh, 
Bruce Willis, Six Sense. Did y'all go out? Did you? I ain't the only one watching movies. <laughs> All right. The movie The Sixth Sense, and y'all remember that? And, and Bruce Willis asked the little boy, and he says, What's wrong? He says, I see dead people. And so Bruce said, There's a lot of people dead. And this little boy says, No, they're walking around. They're going through life. And so, and so Bruce says, So what's wrong with that? He says, They don't even know they're dead. And he said, it was as if my job, that's what the boy said, as if my job was to let them know they were dead. Did y'all see that movie? And I shouted. I said, that's what evangelism is all about. Our job is to let people that's walking around, let them know that they're just walking and really spiritual. Because you can't get anybody saved until you first wreck, until they first recognize they're lost. You can't get anybody saved until they first recognize that they're dead. You know, because otherwise they said, I make more money than you. I got five cars, I got a big house. I seem to be doing okay. And so you can't get anybody saved. And I thought about it. That's our job, just like on the six sisters, little boy. Our job is to let somebody know that they need Jesus Christ. All right? Okay, and so, and so, and so, that's our job. We can't save anyone. We can't give them life. So our job is to lead them to the point of recognizing that they are dead. So Paul reminds them that they used to be dead. They used to be separated in communication with God. And it's interesting, it's interesting because Paul said, now, I ain't no sense of you all getting a big head. You remember the way you were before you accepted Jesus Christ. You were separated from God and couldn't even really communicate with God. And I find that interesting because now the we, the people that can communicate with God, seem like we don't communicate with God enough. It's interesting, it's interesting, it seems like the people that have the uh, uh, opportunity to talk to God have obtained the privilege, privilege to talk to the Father, but rather find time to talk to and about everything else but God. God told Adam that in the day that he eat of the tree of life, he would what? Surely die. And Adam lived physically, but spiritually, he died. He was separated from God and no longer capable of walking and talking with God. And I find that interesting because it seems like Christians, the very ones who have obtained the privilege to talk to the Father, the one that says, well, what a privilege to take everything to the Lord in prayer, but rather find time to talk to and about everything and everybody else but God. Much of our churches, much of our communities, our homes and are in the shape they are in because Christians who do have the right to talk to God would rather exercise this privilege and, and, and not talk to God. Christians rather talk to Dion Warwick than to talk to God. <laughs> Folks would rather put their faith in a lottery ticket and a scratch-off ticket than to dig into the Word of God. We ain't going to ask for a rain hole, show of hands. But I know this right. I know I'm right. I know I'm right. And Paul is trying to lay the foundation, we said, of chapter 4 when he says, I beseech you what to walk worthy of the vocation in which you're called. I can't wait to get there. And so he says, here, step one is not to get so arrogant in your newness of life because I need to remind you of the way you used to walk. And it was only by the grace of God that you were saved. So Paul goes on in verse 2. He says, where in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Paul says not only were you dead, you were dominated. You were dominated and encouraged by the world. You were dominated and excited by the flesh and dominated and energized by the devil himself. This right in the text. Paul said before you came to Christ, you respected the world more than you respected God. You know these people, the ones that respect the lotto ticket and then that to believe in God's plan for prosperity. They respect palm readers more than they do the word of God. And then during the week when it's time for a Bible study, they rather get in encouragement from Van White and Pat St. Jack and, 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 and Alice to Beth. Be like, Pastor, I, I, I gotta go to the doctor. Can you pray for me this week? I like wherever you were last Wednesday at 7 o'clock is your God. You need to go back and buy a vow. I do pray for them. I do pray for them. I do pray for them. That's our job. I pray for them because guess what? I was where they were too. You know. So don't get the big head. You were right there along with them too. Amen. But I still chew them out this way. 
I said, and we have Bible study every week, and, and now all of a sudden you need prayer. Where were you last Wednesday at 7 o'clock? Okay, you, you had to work there. Where were you the last week, the previous one? Where were you the, for Sunday school? Well, where, you know, where, wherever you were at 7 o'clock on Wednesday, that's your God. You need to go talk to that or what? You know, but we still pray one for another, because I don't know about you, Brother Hicks, because I've been there before. There was a time on Wednesday nights I was shooting basketball, okay? All right, so, 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 all right, we don't, we don't chew them out, but we encourage one of y'all with me? All right. I'm just fussing right now. But so, what Paul says, don't get arrogant, don't get big head, you know, you know, but for, because we've all been there. Amen? All right. So again, Paul is laying the foundation of chapter 4. He goes on and says, not only that, we were dead, we were dominated. We were dominated, encouraged by the world, dominated by the flesh, and dominated by the devil. And the point of the message is that we have Christians still living as they are unsaved. Instead of being transformed by the renewing of their mind, some folks conform to control by the values and attitudes of the world. Whatever the world does, seem like we do that, we go right along with it. I think I made the comment once before. Somebody came in on them square toe shoes and, and people came in and they said, Pastor, you wear no bow ties? I said, no, long, not as long as fair, Conway. You will be caught, I will be caught dead in a bow tie. All of a sudden, two more people start wearing them. I went out and got ten. Why? Because I let the world dictate I am. We, we do that. I ain't by myself. Don't look at me funny. But that's what we do. That's what we do. If the world all of a sudden, you know, get got nice rims, you know, with it, kind of nice. And we and you know, we get the same thing, right? And so Paul says, before we were saved, we were dominated by the world, but then he says we were also dominated by the flesh. He says we let the world uh, do that. He says, and then not only that, we were encouraged by the word, dominated and excited by the devil himself. Right there, he says we walk according to the prince of this world, that's Satan himself. Paul reminds us that before we were saved, we were being energized by Satan himself, and just like the energizer bunny, we just kept going on and on and on and on in the wrong direction. Amen. So Paul says we used to be dominated, but not only dominated and dominated by the world, dominated by the devil, dominated by the flesh. Paul speaks of the fallen nature that man was born with that wants to control the body and the mind. And again, we're just trying to sneak up so we can get to the duty. But Paul says, I just believe you'd do better if we knew better. And so he lays out the doctrine so we got to get to the doctrine before we can jump into chapter 4, which we get to real soon in the weeks to come. So Paul says, not only that, we were dominated by the flesh. He says a dog behaves like a dog because a dog has a dog's nature. In other words, you could take a newborn dog, throw that dog in the water, and the dog would know how to swim because he was born with that ability. He was born with that knowledge. It was part of his nature. He didn't have to learn it. Well, at the same time, we were born with the sinful nature. In other words, my mother didn't have to teach me how to lie. I didn't have to go to school to learn how to steal. My father did not have to teach me how to eat. No one had to teach me how to not have patience. No one taught me how to be envious of someone. No one taught me how to lie. Anybody? You know, I can tell you, I won't tell you when I first told her. You know, nobody taught me how to lie. No one taught me how to steal. No one taught me that. We were born with that nature. We came into that world already knowing how to do that. And so Paul says, you need to, you need to go back and remember how you were before God saved your, let me put it in the, the avenue verse, your sorry behind. Amen? What about sinful nature? No one sat me down and taught me how to hate. I was born knowing how to sin. And when we accepted Jesus Christ, we get a new nature. We are delivered from the power of sin. We are delivered from the penalty of sin. But the problem is we have not been delivered from the presence of sin. And because that sin is still all around, we still have a tendency to continue the old nature. Proverbs 26, 11 says, As a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool returns to his father. 
And then God turned around and said, man is the same way. Man is the same way. What are you saying, Pastor? Well, I'm glad you asked. A dog can eat something and make him sick and he will vomit and a few, I don't know how, a few minutes later, a dog will go back and lick it up. Yeah. And as nasty as that yeah. is, God says, man, the same way. Amen. The very thing I'm trying to get out of man's life, the very thing that's making you sick spiritually, the very thing I'm trying to get out of you, you keep returning to. I ain't by myself. Amen. Is this how we live? God says, no. The very thing I've been trying to get out of your life, I've been trying to get you out of that situation. I've been trying to get him, her, or whatever out of your life. I've been trying to get that thing out of your life. I've been trying to get that thing out of you. God said, the very thing that's making you sick, you're returning to. And just like a dog, now so we can picture how nasty that looked to the dog. And God says, well, y'all do the same thing spiritually. Same thing spiritually. So Paul was reminding the church that no, no, no. We got to fix this thing, but don't you think that your salvation is better than the next person's salvation? Don't think as they say your stuff don't stink and all that. Other. No, we all in this thing together. And Paul said, and God has said, of everything that I'm trying to get out of your life, I know I've delivered you from the power of, of sin. I know I delivered you from the penalty of sin, but I, right now you're just not delivered from the presence of sin. And you're going to have to do some things to keep returning to that stuff. And we'll get to that in the weeks to come. So Paul says, a weak man would do the same thing. The very thing God has delivered you from, the very thing God said is making you spiritually sick, you return to. God said, I'm trying to get you out of this out of your system, trying to get you out of that situation, away from that so-called that you think is a friend, yet you're still returning to it. You have a new nature, and you're trying to hold on to the old nature. The very thing I'm trying to get out of your life so you can move forward, you go back to. And then we wonder why five years, two years, three months, four years from now, we're no farther alone than we ought to be. And God says, I've been trying to get you out of your life a long time ago. All right, all right. So Paul says, don't get big-headed and get the big head and never think your salvation was better than somebody else's salvation. We all used to be dead, dominated, and disobedient. And the fact of the matter is that we still struggle. So Paul finally, I'm almost done. Paul in verse 3, Paul says, And you by nature were children of wrath. Just walking through the text. Paul reminds us that before we were saved, that not only were we dead, dominated, and disobedient, but because of Jesus, we were doomed and appointed to everlasting damnation. But because of God's grace, he has quickened us that made us alive, not dead, raised us up and given us a seat in King. In other words, God, who is rich in mercy, loved us. When we were yet sinners, he liberated us, and those who trusted him, he lifted us. And so Paul says, you need to remember how you used to be, and I had not get the big head, because he's trying to sneak up to the duty of a Christian. But yeah. before we get to the duty of the Christian, he said, you need to understand the doctrine of the Christian. You need to recognize uh, that ain't, ain't none of us all that. It was by grace that we were saved. Yeah. Had nothing to do with your little education. Had nothing to do with your little degree. Had nothing to do with your little money. Had nothing to do with your good looks and smooth talk and all that. But it's by grace that we are saved. I remember a few years ago, it's been almost 10 years by now, uh, went to this building, went to uh, what you know, one of my favorite restaurants, and and uh, walked in there, and uh, things were different. Things were different, and it was one of those old buildings, you know, hole in the wall places. But I went in, and they had blooms up, and you know, and and, and the waiter was a little bit more nicer, and the waitress was a little bit more friendly. One of them, you know, I'm so used to that bad attitude, but it, it kind of shocked me. The waitress was more friendly. The atmosphere and, and just things just seems better, you know. Food was even better too. And, uh -huh. and then when I and I had missed the door because I somebody had the door open. But then when I came back out and I looked and the sign on the door had said under new management. And that's how it is when we come to Christ. Right? Outside they look the same. You know, I came to Christ and he didn't drop anywhere. 
you know, I came to Christ, I was still single, nappy head, snotty looking, looking boy. That was the outside, right? But on the inside, I was under new management, you know. And, and that's what I think about. That, that's how it is. I remember I bought one of those houses and and uh and they said, What do you think? I said, needs a whole lot of cosmetic working. And so the outside was all messed up, but on the inside, I was like, well, I'm gonna have to tear down these drywalls and, and put up this and, and rewire this and put a new plumbing here and install that. And that's what God does, you know. He right, right, we have salvation, sanctification, but until he comes back, it's glory for glorification, the same will be on the outside before it just looked the same. I'm the same old nappy headed, whatever, little boy. But on the inside, he's tearing down the drywalls of hatred, putting up new traits of grace. He's rewiring me, right? So I can operate and not blow a fuse so quick and, and be so tempered and, and I don't do that, but y'all know that. It's ready to quick to cuss somebody out and put in some new circuit breakers and on the inside and knocks out this room and put in a, another room for improvement and does all that on the inside because we're now under new management. And so Paul says in chapter 4, brothers, I want you to walk worthy of the vocation and what you're called. But before you do that, you need to know how you got this for. And it was all because of God's grace and not that of yourself should any man boast. Amen. Amen. God bless you.